On today's World Inside, face-to-face talks over mutual concerns between Chinese Premier Li Chang and U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. She has also met with her Chinese counterpart, Commerce Minister Wang Wantao, and other top officials. What are the priorities and what's at stake? Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live from Beijing. Chinese Premier Li Qiang hosts the U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo on Tuesday at the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. The Chinese Premier says both sides should steer economic relations on an even keel for everyone's benefit. Premier Li warned politicizing trade issues and overstretching the concept of national security will not only seriously harm relations and mutual trust, but also undermine the interests of people and businesses across the two countries, not to mention casting a pall on the global economy. Raimondo rules out U.S. efforts to contain China, insisting the Biden administration is far from seeking decoupling. She suggested more talks with China, with the U.S. ready to deepen collaboration in artificial intelligence, climate change, and fentanyl-related issues. Raimondo has also met with Chinese Vice Premier Ha Li Fang and Chinese Minister of Culture and Tourism Hu Ha Ping. This Monday, Chinese Minister of Commerce Wang Wantao met with his U.S. counterpart. In the meeting, the Chinese side noted its concerns over issues including U.S. Section 301 tariffs on Chinese goods, its semiconductor policies, restrictions on two-way investments, discriminatory subsidies, and sanctions on Chinese enterprises. Both sides did express their support for creating a better trade environment. We are ready to work with Washington to foster a more favorable policy environment for cooperation between the two countries' businesses, to bolster bilateral trade and investment in a stable manner, and to inject stronger impetus into the world economic recovery. For her part, Raimondo said recent curbs on U.S. investments in Chinese companies are narrowly focused and not meant to decouple from China. The two sides set up a working group to resolve business frictions and initiated a mechanism to exchange more information on expert controls. Raimondo is the fourth highest U.S. official to visit China in the past three months, none of which left any concrete or tangible results. But Raimondo did say Washington is much interested in stabilizing trade relations and regular communication is at the core of these efforts. On the U.S. Commerce Secretary's visit to China, joining us, uh, we have uh, Professor Michael Powers, Zurich Insurance Group Chair Professor with the School of Economics and Management of Tsinghua University. In Beijing, Chi Qiang, Research Fellow from the Global Issues at Beijing Foreign Studies University. Professor Powers, Mr. Chu, good to see both of you. Now, let's go directly to the results so far. Both sides have reached. The concrete one, two mechanisms. One is yearly meeting between the Commerce Ministers and Commerce Secretary. The other is a working group uh, on exchanging of information regarding the so-called uh, export control. So let's talk about these two things. Uh, Professor Powers, how tangible are these in terms of results this time? I, I think that they're important in the sense that the, the two sides are speaking and they're speaking at a certain level of detail and also, of course, at a fairly high level of government. So, so that is very important and that can help to, to clear the air when necessary mm-hmm. and, and perhaps have, um, engender some co- uh, cooperation, as um, Secretary Raimondo has indicated she would like to do. However, in terms of moving the, the larger issues forward, of uh, resolving uh, the, these trade disputes mm. that have been going on for a number of years, I don't think that that, um, that, that has uh, changed this, the, the basic scenario that right. much at the moment. Do we have more information about exactly at what levels uh, these uh, exchanges and also mechanism is likely to be conducted? One, of course, is the minister. They promise to meet one another every year. Uh, the other thing is about... Uh, Uh, on a regular discussion and how regular it will be, at what levels. Meanwhile, the clearance of 
or the clarity of so-called expert control and measures from both sides, uh, how frequent they're likely to be exchanged, what details, uh, do we know much about it, Professor Powers? I haven't read much about that, but I would imagine that um, on the, the high level, the, the, the ministerial level meetings, those of course are very high profile mm. and they will occur regularly. Um, the other meetings, that's something actually that is going to be interesting and important to watch because if it turns out that they do meet the lower level officials who are meeting to exchange information and work out details, if they do meet with increasing frequency, that would be a suggestion that things are improving. Mm. The relationship is improving and work is getting done. However, if because these are lower profile, if they just sort of peter off over time, then we know that um, they were not very effective. Mm. Mr. Chu, your take on these two mechanisms apparently already being established? Well, I think eventually it's going to be a good news. Um, you know, in the past three years, I think China and America's relations, uh, especially in the trade relations, are uh, facing a free fall situation. And right now, at least, uh, we're making you know some mechanisms to put a break on this free fall. So we're, maybe we're not going to see this trend just to go up reversely immediately, but at least it's not going to be free fall immediately. And then I think uh, in the uh, near future, it's going to be flattening and in mm. a controllable way. And also, according to my information sources, this kind of a meeting mechanism is going to be ministerial level. And in certain circumstances, it's going to be the chief executive level. What does that mean? It means in China, uh, the uh, vice premier in control, of the trade relations uh, will also join in certain circumstances. And in America, and also the uh, counterpart levels of the, uh, the directors or the ministers who are joining in the meeting. But uh, recently, it's going to be ministerial level. Now, this is uh, taking place at a time when we had already three in a series of uh, ministerial visits by the US uh, secretaries and the special envoys to China. Um, earlier in our background, we suggested, uh, as many media also indicated, there were not that much tangible results. But Mr. Powers, to you, you earlier indicated, uh, direct uh, interaction is already encouraging. Now, to what extent do you see trade has become uh, an important component of itself in terms of China-U.S. relations now? I think that it's, it's very important at, at, the, at the present moment. I, uh, Premier Li indicated, or at least uh, as I read it in translation, that uh, the trade relationship, the econ economic relationship, is sort of the ballast of, of the overall relationship be between the two countries. And currently, we have many sources of tension. We have geopolitical tension as China and the United States deal with shifting alliances around the world. We have defense security issues. And of course, we have the trade issues, which have been hanging on now for a number of years. Um, I, I think that because of tensions that have arisen in all of these areas, um, what both sides want to do is focus on the one area where they can make maybe a quicker adjustments uh, that can produce win-win results, which would be um, in the economic area, the trade area. And so I think that that is some of the impetus be behind the current meeting, but also uh, the earlier ones, those high-level um, representatives of Professor Biden that came to China. Mm. If you look at the trade, the numbers are very interesting. 2022 trade numbers, 690.6 billion U.S. dollars bilateral. Now, when you look at the first seven months between China and the United States, the number has already dropped compared to earlier years, uh, about 10% is 9.6% if I got the latest number. So the things are going down very fast. So what do you see is the nature, Professor Powers, of this uh, trip made by Secretary Raimondo? Is it more of a gesture or is it mm, I more of a pragmatic trip based on the actual necessity to save at least the trade record? I think that it's both, but I think that you're right, or I, I think your suggestion is that 
if you if you look at that sequence of high level representatives that have come to China, this uh, Secretary Raimondo's visit, I think, is the most consequential in terms of uh, possible uh, true pragmatic outcomes. Uh, she is the Secretary of Commerce. She is the one who is, is frequently in touch with the senior business leaders in the United States. And they want to they want to get back into business with China following um, this, this COVID period. And they don't want the uh, geopolitical tensions um, that have arisen to get in the way of their ability to trade with China. So if you if you look back, for example, um, at the most recent um, decision, a proclamation by President Biden to restrict certain types of business uh, with China, the business leaders in the United States are yeah. in general concerned about this trend. And they would like to do whatever is possible, recognizing that the administration, the Biden administration, is going to hold some things out as, as national security oriented. But they want to move other things along and try to uh, turn that, that trend around. Mm -hmm. Uh, two things regarding to what you just said, Professor Powers. One is that, uh, yes, indeed, um, Secretary Raimondo is uh, directly with her job description dealing with the business community of the United States. But at the same time, she's also dealing with some of the concrete policies regarding export control and uh, trade frictions, in fact, with China. The other thing is that uh, we are seeing a very interesting picture of uh, China and the U.S. over the past few years. Now, U.S. Uh, election likely to begin uh, next year, of course. Uh, so uh, how much will this trip's result really uh, lead to implementation? That's another, I guess, reasonable question needs to be asked, Professor Powers, briefly before I go to Mr. Chu. Sure. Uh, given what I know now, or, or what one can 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 learn about um, the relationship, I don't think that there is a dramatic um, event or a dramatic announcement that's waiting in the wings mm -hmm. with regard to tariffs. However, I do think you're right. The politics is very important. There's an election coming up. Um, Secretary Raimondo wants to lay the political groundwork for President Biden, perhaps to meet with President Xi sometime mm -hmm. before um, the American election. Yeah. Go to you, Mr. Chu, same question. So how much is being promised and agreed upon this time, even though only two mechanisms, but it's already a big step forward, will likely to be implemented by both sides? Uh, here, probably the U.S. side is a bigger question mark. Oh, yes. Um, first of all, you know, as I said, it's a good signal, because if you take a look at the uh, history of the China-U.S. relations, everything starting beginning with this kind of a mechanism. For example, the high-level dialogue between China and the U.S. used to be a very important power uh, or the cornerstone of forming uh, both countries' relations and the policy, and that was working. So we are hoping this can be working as well because uh, both sides are showing their sincerity, uh, as we can see. And also, secondly, can it work? Well, big question mark. Because recently, I think, political agenda are blinding everybody's eyes, both in the White House and in the Capitol Hill. Everybody's trying to play the blame game and put China in a scapegoat uh, position. I think this is wrong because they fail to understand the beauty of the trade is that both sides of the trade can, you know, benefit from it. Then. And also both sides, you don't even to like or know each other, but when you work together, efficiency can be higher and it can support better living standard. And now the blame game has actually try to, you know, uh -huh. uh, misleading uh, the voters in America. And that trend cannot be easily reversed. So that's the reason why I'm worrying about how this kind of a details can be implemented. Even we show sincerity within a technocrat level, but for the politicians, it can be another story. Mm. Another thing very important to Professor Powers, I don't know whether you have the ultimate answer, probably nobody has, but still worth asking is, what is national security? Now, that terminology has not been explained very well in today's world, and therefore anyone could use, uh, use that as a tag or in its name to do things uh, that could be vulnerable to uh, multiple parties. So, Without knowing within the United States what is national security, how will the U.S. side explain to the Chinese side, for example, in the mechanism, uh, what are the policies? 
I suspect that they will try to do that. Perhaps that's what one of the purposes of these working groups is, is to flesh that out in some detail so there's a better understanding. It would be very difficult to try to explain those things in the necessary detail through, through media. Um, what we have here is we have a situation that goes back to President Donald Trump where he essentially said steel is the core of defense. And so we're going to impose tariffs on steel, anything um, related to steel. It could, could be an issue of national defense. Now, that's, that's so broad that more or less um, anything that any, any component of, of a defense-related system could be seen as being related to national security. So as a result of that, um, you'll notice that the Biden administration really hasn't changed that policy. In fact, it appealed um, the WTO decisions earlier this year um, mm. with regard to those same tariffs. Um, so it's essentially um, supporting that particular policy of the Trump administration. And with such a broad definition of national security, you're, you're absolutely right. It's unclear what it means. And, and I do believe that that's something that um, could, be, um, could be a basis for or, or a, a benefit of these discussions that we're talking about. Mm, the other thing, Mr. Power, uh, are the three latest areas that the U.S. touch on in terms of national security, the chips, uh, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. Uh, these are uh, the three areas. Of course, uh, it sounds like a huge areas because everything we're talking about today could be, you know, in a way categorized in these three things uh, as a result of modern technology. So, um, once again, how well do you see if you were sitting in one of those discussions between Chinese and the U.S. officials uh, in this mechanism that had just been established about explaining so-called export controls, to what detail you would go to explain to your Chinese counterpart about any of these areas so that there can be some kinds of at least uh, understanding beyond the language of English? I think that um, in such a meeting, from, from what I know of these types of discussions, they, they will begin with, with broad principles and try to place the policies, the specific policies with regard to specific trade items in the context of some kind of overriding philosophy that, that is coherent. However, when you get right down to it um, and you have to try to rationalize something like sheet steel or aluminum, um, in that context, you can see that almost anything could fit in, if you're going to have such a broad definition to start with. So what I suspect um, will happen is that there will be sort of a binary discussion that the China will say, what about this? And the United States will say, yes, it's, this is in. And China will say, what about that? And you'll say, well, maybe, maybe this is out, but mm. maybe we can discuss this. I, I think that um, there, there will not be a clear easily um, easily interpreted mm. um, description of, uh, of what security policy is. Right. I think we're going to be looking at, at the devil that's in the details. Right. Mr. Chu, clarity. Clarity and clarity. I think that is what the business communities from both sides really need to have. Otherwise, how could they trade? This is uh, such a simple you know, uh, question, isn't it? So. What about that clarity? What kinds of levels of clarity can China make to the U.S. side if uh, the discussions are going on within that mechanism? Uh, for example, earlier China also banned uh, some of the U.S. chips. Uh, I wouldn't mention the name and the specific companies. But how will China explain about what is China's national security and how will that work within this uh, uh, discussion? Well, I think this national security topic is just a pseudo topic because uh, China used to export, uh, you know, labor intensive products to America and in return uh, U.S. provide China with high value product like chips, like semiconductors and et cetera. So if you're talking about national security, I think China as a side should worry about that because Chinese machine and the Chinese government, the Chinese, you know, in many high end factories or even in the defense systems are using American products isn't we should be the one who worrying about that and also plus that mm. if you take a look at the uh, technology side all kinds of the chip design like amd framework like the uh, even for the encryptors uh for the chips those are open sourced 
which means everybody will see what happens inside of it. If you have the pattern, you have the copyright, if you have the right machine, you can do it by yourself. The only thing stop China or Japan or other country to do it because American company hold those copyrights, this pattern, which impede China or other competitors from doing it. So if America really want to stop this uh, national security issue, it probably wouldn't uh, you know, ask other people to create it by themselves rather than buying from America's side. And if China really wants to do that, I think China, well, out of the national security reason, they should do it by itself rather than buy it from America. So I think the right clarity is to show America that it's only by trading with each other, restoring what we have been doing in the past, and that is meeting our both of our mm -hmm. most extent of the national security mm -hmm. rather than agitate confrontation. Okay. Professor Powers, if I could interpret what uh, Mr. Chu said, and I, if I understand it correctly, is that the U.S. Uh, export control is not only creating a stronger China, uh, it seems uh, technology-wise, that seems to be his argument. Uh, I think that that's part of what his, he said, yes. Uh, it, it is. I mean, if you, if, if you decouple and there are areas in which China was relying on the United States or its allies for certain um, components, now China uh, realizes it has to, to do those on its own or it has to seek other trading par partners to provide them. Mm. Certainly that, um, that strengthens its hand. Uh, decoupling is a, is a two-edged sword. And I don't think that either side um, really wants to go that far. But I, I think that on the American side, um, what's, what's really important is the political context and the posturing that the Biden administration needs to go through at this point in time. It has an election coming up. President Biden would like, he has to be tough on China. But at the same time, it would be really nice if he could score some success on a treaty or a meeting with with President Xi, something that, that shows that he, okay. is, he is a world leader and, and, and so forth. So I, I think that, that those are the, 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 the influences that will govern the discussion. Talking about the highest level of discussion, we have seen the two presidents met during the G20 summit uh, last time, last year, and uh, leading up to the APEC uh, uh, economic leaders meeting, it is going to be taking place in San Francisco, this time in the United States. And meanwhile, many suggest that both sides, usually the heads of state, would attend these occasions. So uh, having said that, though, if you were in the administrations, U.S. and China, looking at the time that we have left from now until then, it's only about two months, almost. So with that luxury of 60 days, <laughs> Uh, how much uh, need to be laid down as the rail, rails uh, for the two leaders to have a fruitful meeting, to have a meeting in front of the world and the world realize, hmm, this is an important and significant meeting. I guess both sides would need that. So, Professor Powers? Well, I, I, I'm not exactly a student of the, this area of political science, but <laughs> I, I would suggest that it's possible mm. that the two leaders could meet in a friendly way without having too much of a substantive result, and it would be either a neutral outcome or, or perhaps positive for both sides. Um, there is not that much urgency coming from either side. There is danger. There are risks that either side has to take. Um, I think that in the current context, you know, China would like the United States to stop to, to stop preventing U.S. companies and um, its, its allies from, from buying certain products from China. That's something that, that could benefit China immediately. Um, and I think on, on the, the American side, I think President Biden would like to, to be able to, you know, reach some kind of agreement that would show that, that he's achieved something during his first administration. Mm. Mr. Chu, same question to you. Well, I think uh, for the top leaders, they are communicatable. They know each other, and uh, they have the willingness to talk to each other. I think for China's side, we've been doing positive uh, actions. For example, we're creating the white list and the black list to try to clarify what is uh, suitable for Chinese uh, business soil, what is not, to let people know what we can do. And China's showing uh, the sincerity and the willingness uh, to contact us. 
Uh, for America, I think for uh, President Biden himself, I think it's okay. But the big problem is that the current atmosphere in a political uh, arena in America is very, very confrontational in itself. Uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, they are still fighting against each other in many fronts. And that can create a problem for uh, President Biden. So the China card is the only thing, well, well, a few, quite a few things they can play among the bipartisan arena. Mm -hmm. I think that is a problem. Like you said, 60 days is really luxury for President Biden. I don't think it's very easy for him to handle down those turmoils back inside the home. But if he can manage that, I think China and America can you know, stabilize for quite a while. My final observation before we go, I do want to hear your thoughts on this as well. It's so easy just to throw out those rhetorics and lead the relationship to a downfall. It is so difficult to make every baby steps to walk back some of the lost areas of trade between China and the United States. This is my personal observation. I don't know about yours, Professor Powers. Yes, I, I, I think it is. Um, we, we saw that the United States uh, took 27 countries, 27 companies, Chinese companies, off uh, its list um, that were uncertified. Now, presumably, those, those companies can do trade with the United States. But that's a very small baby step forward. After a few weeks ago, you might say, um, you know, President Biden took two, maybe three bigger, much bigger steps backward with, mm. with restrictions on technology. So it is a difficult process. Mr. Chu, your final observation. Well, like our old Chinese saying said, before you pull any gigs or make any fuss, you need, uh, you know, food. So trade and economy is still the cornerstone of both China and uh, U.S. relations. And also it's what you need the most for the rest of the world. More than ever, I think okay. China and the U.S. should work together again to stabilize the world economy. One of the things we have learned about China-U.S. relations is you will never get too optimistic or too pessimistic because uh, too pessimistic will really not lead us to some concrete uh, and constructive uh, actions. Too optimistic, sometimes you can be disappointed. I guess uh, the go the middle way, as they say, follow the means, uh, the doctrine of means, as Confucius said, may be the good way at this moment. <laughs> For now, thank you so much for both of you joining us. I'm Michael Powers, Chi Chang from China and the United States. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, find us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of my team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.